the problem in that, that I wanted to address in clinical science is that to the extent that anything that physicians do is evidence-based, it's mostly derived from randomized controlled trials, which are big population-based studies where large groups of people are assigned at random to one treatment or another. And these trials are really effective for generating what are known as average effects, and that's, those are the effects of the treatment for the average person. But the problem is that not everyone is average. In fact, most of us aren't average, and some of us are going to respond better than the average person to a treatment, particular treatment, and some of us will respond worse, sometimes way worse. So one, there's a number of solutions that are in development to this general problem, but one of the solutions is called N of one trials, which are um, uh, clinical experiments designed for the individual patient. And they're, they're simply crossover experiments where a patient is switched back and forth between treatments uh, in some kind of balanced, standardized, or randomized way. The full-blown version of, our, of, uh, of N of 1 trials involves three important components. One is this idea of randomization or balance, where patients are switched back and forth between treatments so that, for example, it might not be enough to get really reliable data to just go on treatment A for a while and then switch to treatment B. If you wanted to get more reliability, you might want to see some sort of pattern like A, B, A, B. But that could also be rebalanced, such as A, and then B for a time, and then B again for a time, and then ending up with A. That's what's known as a balanced design. So balance or randomization is really important. Um, uh, in many trials, especially of medications, blinding is important, and that's trying to keep um, both the patient uh, or person or any clinician who's involved um, unaware of which treatment is which at any given time. And um, the third and probably most important element is systematic co collection of outcomes. Because the typical way that we change treatments in clinical practice is that um, we'll apply a treatment, we'll prescribe a treatment, and the patient will go off and take it or not take it, as we heard during the adherence talk. And they'll come back and we'll ask, so how are you doing on treatment X? And they'll say, well, I, th I think I'm better, and we'll continue it. Or they'll say, uh, I had this terrible side effect, which may or may not have been really associated with the treatment, and they stop the treatment and say, OK, we'll try, try something else. Or uh, they're not sure they're getting better, and then maybe we'll try something else again. But if we collect outcomes much more systematically, then the idea is that we can have a, uh, a much clearer view of whether it, a treatment is, is working uh, better in comparison to something else. Now, some of these elements can be, um, I think the first two elements can sometimes be sacrificed. And in the trial, I'm, uh, the project I'm going to describe to you, we actually sacrifice the blinding element because we're dealing with, um, in some cases, behavioral um, interventions. And in others, it, it just simply wouldn't have been practical to blind. But we maintain this element of balance and also systematic collection of outcomes. So you might say, um, if this uh, technology, this N of 1 technology, is so great, then why hasn't it been more widely implemented? Well, there's really two reasons. One is that, of course, N of 1 trials don't apply to every kind of patient or every condition. It's better if it's a, a chronic condition that's symptomatic or at least can be monitored on some kind of regular systematic, uh, some regular systematic way. And, um, and uh, of course, uh, it doesn't work well for rapidly progressive, uh, let alone fatal conditions. So N of 1 trials don't apply well to all conditions. And um, uh, that's, that's, that's actually the, uh, the main thing that, uh, uh, that I wanted to say there. Now, um, here's, uh, now, now I finally get to the main course, which is our study. So the, the PREEMP study is personal research for monitoring pain treatments. And um, what we're trying to do is to bring together uh, clinicians and patients together with this assist technology. And that's really the other thing I wanted to mention. So the other reason that N of 1 trials haven't been well adopted is because in um, qualitative study after qualitative study, when we ask people, uh, why don't you uh, want to do these things? the main answer, the, the most common answer is, it just isn't worth the trouble. That's because setting up N of 1 trial services takes a lot of time, effort, and, and resources, and a lot of investment from 
clinicians and patients. So the, the question we had with preempt was if we had some kind of assistive technology that could make it way easier for doctors and patients to conduct these trials, could they accomplish them uh, much more readily and would they be uh, therefore be more ready to adapt them? So we chose a very common and prevalent condition in the United States, chronic pain. Uh, and uh, we recognize that many patients who are treated for chronic pain aren't receiving satisfactory results. And working with OpenM Health and their homage system, um, a, uh, a, you know, a, a mobile health uh, connected to a desktop health application was developed. And um, we've now started to put this into use in a randomized controlled study funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, this is the flow of the of the experiment, the broader experiment that we're conducting. We're taking patients with chronic pain. We hope when we're done, we'll have 244 of them. Right now, we have about 150 enrolled and about 80 randomized. Um, these patients are randomly assigned to receive the trialist app. That's what we call the application, the, the trialist, or to continue receiving usual care. Those who are assigned to the trialist sit down with their clinician and and design their own N of one clinical trial. Those assigned to usual care just get usual care. And then their outcomes are checked at three, six, and 12 months. The principal outcome, the primary outcome for the study being pain-related interference is measured by the uh, PROMISE scale at six months. Uh, this is a difficult slide to see, but basically this is the desktop setup that the clinician and patient will look at together and they'll essentially choose one treatment from column A and one from column B. Each column contains the same list and there are a couple of over-the-counter categories of medications, some prescription medications, and then uh, lifestyle and complementary and alter alternative uh, treatment interventions. And then they select a study start date, a period length, which can range from one to four weeks, and number of cycles, number of AB cycles. So do you do uh, the minimum number being twice? You have to do at least AB, AB, or the equivalent, but you can do AB, 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 or, uh, or so on, up to a total trial length, uh, maxing out at three months because no one has the patience to do that kind of experiment for longer. And, um, and then the patients uh, using the homage system, they get reminded to start uploading their data on a daily basis. They get told when to switch between treatments. They, um, they answer questionnaires every day and they can take a peek at their data along the way uh, in sort of, on sort of an interim basis as shown here. And then at the very end of the trial, they get to see their results. And we have a number of ways of presenting results to patients based on some input we got from focus groups and inter interviews with patients. And starting over in the upper left, uh, that's kind of the raw data. And you can see uh, on the red treatment versus the blue treatment, there's some differences, but there's a lot of scatter on a day-to-day -day basis. Then on the, on the next slide over to the right, or next uh, frame over to the right, you can, uh, the uh, treatments A and B are sort of separated out. And you can see that maybe pain levels are, seem to be a little higher, uh, blue versus red. That's um, more starkly illustrated in the uh, frame farthest to the right. And then uh, finally, we provide a summary not only of uh, pain levels on treatment A versus B, uh, but also some of the common side effects that might be attendant to certain pain treatments in the final frame uh, on the bottom. And the patients and clinicians uh, can have access to some minimal training through some videos that are available on our study website at uh, preemptstudy.org. Um, some of them access these training videos and others do not, but most of them seem to be able to intuit what these um, uh, results displays are telling them. So um, in summary, our, our goal here is to, um, is to engage patients to a greater degree in, um, in their health care and in their health, um, to obtain greater therapy therapeutic precision, that is to make better choices about therapies. We, we tend to invest a lot of effort in medicine and diagnostic precision, um, but therapeutic precision, ther therapies again are chosen often on the basis of trial and error like I described 
earlier. And of course, the ultimate goal of this particular study is to help patients achieve better pain control. And um, the pathway is, is this individualized N of one approach, which is kind of analogous to craft beer. It's not for everyone. Some people like Pabst Blue Ribbon or whatever. Um, but it is, it, for some, it, it's a very powerful uh, way to go. And we call this personalized medicine without the metabolomics or genomics or proteinomics that um, the people in my academic medical center and others get so excited about, but which uh, maybe uh, won't necessarily have uh, or as much impact on a day-to-day -day basis as something like this. So with that, I'll end. I don't know if I'm on time or not, but um, go to questions. I think this is a pretty cool um, way to potentially engage a patient. Um, it sort of gives them an investment in an experiment they've designed for themselves. I'm wondering just practically, um, if, is the patient sitting down with the physician to sort of pick and design the experiment and, and in a pragmatic way, how long does that take together? Do you have to have an appointment that is, you know, 45 minutes in length in order to help design this with the patient? Yeah, so it would have been harder to, um, to answer that question, you know, a year ago because we would have had to guess and pray and, and dib because we didn't really know when, they, when clinicians asked us that question because that was a very common question. But it turns out in practice, uh, it's about what we guessed, which is about five to ten minutes added on to whatever else the patient and clinician are doing that, that visit. So for some clinicians, they squeeze it into a regular visit, even visits of 20 minutes length. You know, they're dealing with pain anyway, and it's, uh, and this is just part of that. Other clinicians, um, you know, uh, try to schedule longer visits in order to accommodate the study. I just have a comment. I, I think this is terrific, and, and I just want to tell everybody in the room, this is huge for our field and, and, and this, this method of research, because this was not, not possible until we had the platforms that we're talking about developing today. So this is going to be a game changer in terms of how we do research. And I was there at the Precision Medicine meeting in February, I mean, where a lot of us are looking at this, but these new designs are really critical. So heads up, pay attention to this.